Arteta! What a strike! Arsenal end the season in style with a comfortable win and avoiding the ignominy of the Europa Conference. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Alex Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. I uh, didn't know ignominy was going to squeeze in there. And as I was saying it, I was like, am I saying this right? But I just committed to it and went. And I, I hope it I hope it went right. That's right. Um, Maybe what we will do later in this podcast is a dramatic reading of some of the clubs that Tottenham Hotspur might face in the Europa Conference. There is literally a club named Europa FC. So, so uh, yeah, uh, there is one one stadium they will be playing at where there is a train track that actually goes by the stadium in front of the supporters and trains actually travel across the train track. So, uh, oh, that's for real. That video. <clears throat> yeah, that's real. That's I a real thing. I thought that was a joke. No, nah, it's a real thing. And I, for one, uh, you know, I'm not saying I want the Spurs players to get hit by trains or anything, but I certainly look forward to watching them play there and everywhere else. And who knows, maybe they'll get the kind of manager who thinks it's a really important competition and, and like plays serious first team players on cow patches in the most distant and remote portions of uh, the UEFA member nations. So should be interesting. Uh, Leicester, whew, that's a bad look, isn't it? Back to back. Uh, Champions League choking campaigns. Uh, maybe get on to that. Get on to the Spurs hilarity. I-, I read an interesting statistic. Gareth Bale has finished trophyless for the first time since leaving Spurs because he went back to Spurs. So, so that's that's another ignominious distinction. Uh, but we are going to talk Arsenal. So let me just lay out the plan real quick and then I'll introduce everyone. We'll get started. The plan is roughly this. We are going to do the Brighton game today. And a little bit of laughing about how the season panned out. Maybe a little crying too. But then Thursday, we will do the exit interview for the season. Uh, Highs and lows, best performances, worst performances, player of the season, go to the season. We'll revisit the predictions we made at the start of the season. And... Uh, and, and then sort of compare and contrast how wrong we were and how much more wrong we were and how not right we were about anything. Please do not ask me about my prediction for league starts for William Saliba at this time. I have no comment. And then um, on Monday, we'll put out more of a player rating, manager rating thing where we'll go through a deep dive of the squad and do it that way. One thing we're going to be doing that is really, really fun and I'm really excited about is we're going to, for patrons, if you've been following the... Um, instant reaction pods this season. Liney uh, in the Discord was kind enough to create a Google document tracking every stock rising and stock falling we did this season. So we are going to do an accounting of which stonks performed best and worst this season and how that lines up with how we feel about the season they had. So that should be fun too. So now that all that nonsense is out of the way, we are one week away from announcing, officially announcing the live event that I pretty much told everybody about, but actually announcing it uh, in a week. So I'm excited about that. Tim's on Twitter. Still, hello, Tim. Hello, no. Clive's on Twitter. Clive PMC. Hello, Clive. Yeah, hello, hello. Paul's on Twitter. Pause my pants. Hello, pause. Woo-hoo. My tactic is to talk and talk and talk, lull them into a false sense of security. Then when they're not paying attention, introduce them while they're muted and see how long it takes for them to scramble to the mute button. And I feel, I feel Tim, in your case, I, I got you that time. But bef- yeah, yeah, did I? <laughs> I? I had the cursor on, um, on like I over the <laughs> mute button, but my hand kind of slipped Panicked. on the mouse as you as you <laughs> fell asleep. So took it away. Was yeah. it your vaccinated arm, Tim? <laughs> no, my unvaccinated arm. Tim, any 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 ill effects yet? No, you feeling all right? Uh, no, no, but I I do now worship uh, Bill Gates. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, he's uh, he's single, so ladies. <laughs> um, okay, Tim, let's start with you just for a second because in addition to a really fun performance, I thought that'll be interesting to analyze. There were fans at Emirates yeah. Stadium, and I think you might argue that had it been. Uh, open to full capacity, we might have seen the same number of fans at Emirates Stadium. Yeah. A, a question worth asking, perhaps. But um, I know it was a little soggy before the game, and that rained on the protests a little bit, and maybe on your plan to be a part of it. But do you want to just kind of give us your two-minute summary of the feeling of returning, the day at the ground, the difference in how <coughs> that was handled with, with COVID uh, restrictions, mm. and just generally the experience of being back at the home of football? Yeah, sure. So it was a really, really nice day and I'm very hungover, which was the best thing about the day, really. Actually, it it was quite nice. I had a really like the most normal weekend I've had. 
um, because we had uh, one of the guys I go to Arsenal with, we had his stag drinks on Saturday. So um, actually went out to a pub with other people on Saturday um, and then, yeah, had a few drinks before this game, had several drinks afterwards and everyone's feeling terrible today, which is great. But the actual kind of experience of being back, really, really nice. Like the, um, it, it wasn't, it didn't feel as weird to be in that bigger crowd as I thought it would be. Um, I mean, I've been to plenty of matches during lockdown, uh, like the women's games, but they're all behind closed doors and there's only about 20 people there. Mm. So uh, just from the press. So I thought I'd feel quite weird about being in a stadium with 10,000 people. But to be honest, everything's like 10,000 people sounds like a lot. But in a place where there's 60,000 seats, like I don't think I was genuinely within a meter of anyone the mm. whole time that I was in there. It was all in terms of the social distancing, absolutely fine as you'd expect. Um, I'd been to the Rapid Vienna game, so the entrance was was all pretty familiar, mm. and you can't get into the stadium bowl without showing your ticket and things like that. Um, you know, a few hiccups with the actual ticket, like um, I didn't get the email through with my tick because um you, you don't use your membership cards for these games at the moment they just like they email you a pdf and mine didn't work essentially interesting <laughs> um and they didn't send it to me on time so you know small hiccups really but inside the having ground, interacted was, um, with you on technical issues in the past I, I won't rule out user error but you know yeah, it's okay it's yeah 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 <laughs> no definitely um but yeah, yeah, and and so the actual um, feeling of being inside was was really really nice. It, it would have been nice if the game had more riding on it because I think after the first kind of twenty minutes and you get the initial chanting and yes we're back, it, you know that that novelty kind of starts to disappear and then it's like oh yeah the, this game doesn't really mean anything <laughs> actually. But um, but just little things that you forget like um, the polite ripple of applause when someone heads the ball back to a goalkeeper like why. Like I, but it's it's just one of those things that's understood that everyone does, and um, I I said this in one of the videos, but a lot of people focus on the ferocity of the crowd and how they can be poisonous and things like that, and they definitely can. Um, but it, it's the generosity of the crowd as well that that really kind of gets me. So yeah, heading the ball back to the goalkeeper is apparently worth a round of applause, but. It's funny that when someone shoots, even if it goes way over the bar, you still get a round of applause. Or, and it, it just made me think of those risk reward players. You know, um, if you if you overhit a through ball, you still get a round of applause. Like crowds in that respect are quite simple, um, and sometimes that's right and sometimes that's wrong. But generally, if you try to do something or if you try to take a risk like a crowd rewards it but the, the other things I, I guess my my other kind of observation that i'll finish with is just so i was in the upper tier again i wasn't in my my usual seat um i was in the north bank upper behind the goal but just some of the things you forget about watching players live but particularly when you're you're slightly elevated and you can see everything and some players just make a hell of a lot more sense and it it probably won't surprise you to hear that Smith Rowe is one of them. And it's for the same reason that he looks great on TV, right? Because he's always on the screen. Well, when you're in the stadium, that he just, it gets you, right? He's he's never standing still. And again, fans really value that stuff. And um, and you can see all the kind of the patterns. And, and it's, you know, I always said this thing about like Ozil, for example, the online adulation never made it into the stadium, really, which is not to say I, I think he was hated or anything. It's just players like that, but perhaps unfairly, just don't, they just your eye isn't drawn to them in the stadium like it is someone like Smith Rowe. Um, and you look at the popularity of someone like Thomas Rosicki. Thomas Rosicki was loved in the Emirates. Everyone loved him. Theo Walcott very quite divisive online loved in the Emirates loved because he runs in straight lines and you can see him and he takes shots at goal and he puts crosses in. And so th these kind of players really get rewarded by a crowd. And it, it really made me think of Pepe. And I, I thought to myself, I mean, look, everyone can see that Pepe's improved, but I thought to myself, I wonder how different things would feel, you know, or, or if there would be a difference between the people who see him in the stadium, trying to do these things, trying to take players on, um, compared to on TV where he can look a little bit more and, and indeed be a little bit more peripheral. Um, but in in general, just 
just really really nice to be back in a crowd and just hear those those sounds again um that you know the gasps when someone brings a ball down and just appreciating like the touch of someone like Erdgaard and you just see how smooth he is and mm. how like the mechanics of his body are just so um you know silky i i think you do get that more um, yeah. inside the stadium um but yeah and then afterwards i went out and got drunk and it was great and that's that's kind of what it's all about I guess, Tim, the point is, it's days like that, days that those of us, you know, and I was going to say those of us who aren't able to go to the Emirates don't get, but I guess to be fair, Mm -hmm. the pub experience and going and watching it with local supporters groups is all part of it. It's days like that that remind you that football doesn't just have to be about where you finish in the table and what the results are. But when you Mm -hmm. can't go do any of that, you become even more focused on everyone's performance, every result. Every yep. And I'm not saying, by the way, that over the past several years we didn't care about those things and now we suddenly do. But when there's no fun, when there's no camaraderie, when there's no day out, then those things become all that's left. So it, it must have been nice to end a difficult season being reminded of what football can be about when it's not just about the points, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And like the players came out after and actually it was like the, the whole lap of honor thing was slightly sloppily done because they didn't really explain um, how it was going to work or whether they were going to go around or they just went in the center circle and, and that was kind of fine. It was quite funny though, like, you know, they announced David Luiz leaving and, you know, he he got a round of applause, which he thoroughly deserved. But then when the players started jumping up and down, like the applause just stopped as it, and, I, and I understand, right, it's between the players because David Luiz is very popular, but it was almost like everyone just went, yeah, right, that's a fuck enough. Like, we finished eighth. Like, don't jump around in the, in the center circle. <laughs> it's just like that really interesting, almost like it sounds like a weird thing, counterintuitive thing to say about a crowd that you have like a nonverbal cue like that, that it's just like, yeah, all right, you've got your round of applause. Like, fucking stop this though now. Yeah, well, uh, look, it is it is a bittersweet moment to be back at the Emirates and then have the football be done and with the season that we had. And in a way, you know, it felt like the start of a season, but it is in fact the end. And I think some would say mercifully. Clive, in this game, one of the things that I, I think really stood out to me was the Odegaard performance. And Arteta has been searching for a system that I think he can really hang his hat on. We can certainly debate in more of our exit interview um, episode later this week about the the extent to which we finished this season on a real high. I, I know there's some debate about that, but it would appear to me that when he's had the players he wants available, that the 4-2-3-1 like we saw against Brighton is a system that he trusts, that works for him, that works for our talent. And a player who looks really good in it is Odegaard. Uh, when we tried the more four three three type thing, I think it was a bit of a struggle for him. But in this role, he certainly looks like he can perform. Now, I think Odegaard has some sort of Ozilian qualities, both in terms of his his talent, his class on the ball, but also maybe the ability to play when it's fun and, and drift when it isn't. But setting that aside, I thought this was a great performance for him. And so it's our last look at him. He'd certainly be someone that we would be considering trying to get, whether we even can get him or not at any price is is a different question, but he certainly leaves us on a high. So both in terms of his performance against Brighton and in terms of where that leaves you with him being a priority for the summer, what's your, your sort of lasting final thought on him? Yeah. So, um, well, I, I don't quite agree. We played four, three, three. I just think the dynamics of a Sabayas versus a Shaka gives you a different system base straight away the ability to cover parts of the pitch and knowing where to stand. You have a different base and then well, so, Odegaard. So just to be clear, I thought this was a four two three one. It is, is Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but when the different when he struggled was ankle injury and when Tobias was the other partner in the I see what you to okay. yep. mm-hmm. That's when he struggled and it looked more like that, but I don't think he was. I think he's down to the players driving the system. So in where he said he tends to play in the same space continuously just slightly on the right hand side and he tucks in and he and he turns around and he gets the ball off party and he does his thing he either does his short long switch through the lines very very clever player and when he's at his best he he moves well and I think what Tim said there about mechanical me I know I know what he means he, he his ability to move around the ball you know you get some people who are one footed but they're one footed but they're not clever and getting it onto their foot. You know what I mean? They're good foot He's very clever on getting onto his good side, and he knows exactly what he's going to do to create room to get it onto his good foot. 
He's got 20 moves that allows him to get the ball where he wants it to be. And so he looks very nice. My only, well, my only issue with him is I think he suits a team that's really in charge of the game. Again, and when we're in charge of the game, he looks absolutely brilliant because he can play against deep blocks. He can manipulate things. He can create things. When we're not in charge of the game, he's much more of a passenger. And I've got to ask myself this question. We've been talking on this podcast for hundreds of issues, hundreds of episodes, sorry. And and what I don't want to see are players that can only do a small number of things and we can only play them on a certain day in a certain game scenario. I'd, I'd much rather see people that can adjust and adapt to the game that's in front of them, whether it be a day when we're having a good day or a day when we're on top. And we, we don't want to have to bench people on or take people off because they just can't manage the game that's in front of them. So I have a little bit of a an issue with that. But you can't deny his talent and ability. And I think with what we do at Arsenal, we basically play double tens. The Smith throw is a slightly different ten. He tends to come short, then go long. Odegaard tends to come short and progress the ball either with a little dribble or a pass. But we do sort of play double tens with a forward and then a, a loose forward in um, Saka or, or Pepe in this case. So that double 10 suits him. That box suits him with two behind, two in front. That really suits him. That actually plays to his skill set. And he actually plays to Smith Rowe's skill set as well. And Saka can do that box shape really easily. So Arsenal, he may have found a place that suits him. And much like Joe Willock, I'm not sure you're going to get onto him later, Elliot, he may have found a place. He got a stock rising him. yesterday. <laughs> yeah. He may have found a place that suits him as a tearaway third midfielder, really almost a hard tactical fit, almost like a, a bit like Deli Alley. Also, he's a hard tactical fit. Wasn't quite an eight in a four three three. Wasn't quite a ten as a second goal scorer. Yeah. But Poch made it work. I look at Joe Willock and think very much like Deli Alley, systemic wise. You need to have the perfect system for him. And only God suits us. I a bit a bit of me five percent of me says. I want a bit more oomph, just a bit more oomph to allow you to to go with the big boys. We're still trying to find 20-odd points. Can we go with the big boys? Here you've got to bring goals, you've got to bring a little bit more pace, a bit more oomph for me, and I'm not quite sure we should turn into family silver for him, but very nice player. Now alone, I wouldn't be against it. Well, I'll, I'll stay with you just for a second, Clive, and pro- Paul, I, I promise you're part of the podcast. I apologize, but just real, real quick, Clive. A player that we would also be looking at was on that pitch, and he was playing for Brighton, and his name is, is Basuma. I know you like the player. I thought on a bad day for Brighton, he was a player who stood out. And we'll we'll get to the Shaka party partnership coming up, but just with respect to the sort of lasting image he might have put in Arsenal minds um, in a day when Josh Kroenke's in, in, the, in the stands and, um, you know, transfers are certainly on everybody's mind on the final day of the season— did he leave that lasting impression for you that makes you want to go uh, try try to back up a truck and get him? I would back up the truck for him. Yeah. And you could see, I think, for those who've been trying to work out what part he is and looking at him and the expectations are on him because of the price tag and where we spent our money, etc. Then you see party play with Shaka, who plays slightly deeper on the slant or just to the side. There's a partnership there. You just then just project and imagine a partnership with Pazuma and and look at the look at his speed across the ground, look at his ability on the ball, look at his his get out ability to step through people. Mate, he could, he's a classic example of I don't care what day it is, we're going to war with you. Whether I want you to push on, you can push on. If I want you to cover the gaps because we've overcommitted, you can do that too. You can receive the ball at the in the, at the tee, turn around. Unlike Sabias, we all know what happens then when he's left exposed. He can he actually did it in the first two minutes of the game. Got it, turned around, ran through two people, popped it off. I just smiled to myself. He he's just he he makes the game look really easy. And I know some people say, Well, we don't need you know, they're the same players, they're not the same players. Part is much more on the slant, he's more of the guy, the next one up. He's got Zuma could play deeper, play. right? He could play a little yeah, deeper for us. Yeah, he can play deeper. Clean up. Mm-hmm. But he, he, he's more suited to a 4-3-3 three, three than Party is, actually, as the deepest one. And if I had a 4-3-3, three, three, I'd play Party on the, on the right eight. But, mm. but yeah, I just think he's exactly what we need. Um, I, I hope the club think the same. I'm not the only one thinking this, by the way. Half the Arsenal world thinks this. 
And sometimes the player presents itself to you. And I wish we'd have got it done sooner because now everybody likes him. Everyone spotted him. There is no secret. Well, I don't know what you guys think. You, it depends. In a four-two-three-one, that is what we need. Those two, we, that is top four stuff. Yeah, right I, I, I'd have. <clears throat> and I mean, given that there's always a little bit of risk in any transfer, the fact that he has played in the Premier League and looked good against Premier League opposition is a, a check in his favor. Obviously, it's also probably going to impact the price. And you do have to ask, does Arsenal need to be the club that finds someone like him who's $20 million cheaper in a league that's less scouted? Or do we need to be the club that gets someone that we can be more confident in what we're what we're going to get and just spend some effing money? I, I don't know. That's, that's one for the summer we'll definitely come on to. But Paul, I, I mean, 20 minutes into the podcast is probably too long before we talk about star boy Nicola Pepe. And I, and I joked on the Instant Reaction pod, but I think it's pretty clear. We have massively, massively underpaid for this guy. I mean, we stole him, essentially. Uh, 72 hmm. million pound Pepe, now looking like 72 million pound Pepe. And I, I just, I think the thing that is a real challenge with him is the further out towards the touchline he gets, the more frustrating a player he becomes. The closer to the box he gets, and once he's in the box, he's an absolute stone-cold killer. Uh, another right foot finish, another sh- a shot from a central space in the penalty area for one goal, and then you know another beautiful curling left-footed finish. And the way he takes it early is sensational. Just a really nice build-up to that goal in general. Shaq interception, Ozo, Ozo, uh, Ozo sorry. <laughs> uh, send, pl- please send your hate messages to uh, at Clyde PAFC. Um, the, the Odegaard pass, I mean, just a beautiful goal, but there is, there is a clear progress being made by Pepe, but one of the things that I think is starting to happen is that we are kind of retconning the past. Pepe finished last season really strong. I think multiple people on this very podcast had him as the potential breakout player for this season based on the way he finished last season. Now there's a lot of Mikel had to put him through hell to get him to where he knew what was expected and look at how it's paid off. I'm not sure I'm ready to buy into that narrative. What I am ready to buy into, though, is he consistently looks like he is putting in the work, doing what he's asked, and producing the end product. So... I guess the question I have for you is, based on the way Pepe has finished this season on this performance, has he sort of stepped into a a role now where that right-sided wide forward position should be his? Does he have the right to say, this is mine, everyone else go find themselves their own position? Uh, So, I mean, the challenge with that is Saka is really, really good from the right. (laughs) It's a really tricky challenge for us, but... Uh, and the other challenge yeah. is we won't have quite as many games next year to the point where you could kind of play the same first 11 mm-hmm. for most of the season. You probably should, potentially. Right? Yeah. So it's it's a bit of a naughty problem. <clears throat> I would suggest that the answer is that while I agree with you, uh, you see how dangerous Pepe is when he moves a little more centrally. Um, there's a way of playing that Arteta has in mind. <clears throat> Whether we like it or not, that's who we signed. And the player, like Pepe against Crystal Palace was very much stuck on the touchline, right? That was one game ago. And in this game, he got to be more central, maybe because we had more control, maybe because Crystal Palace weren't sitting in a deep block, so we didn't have to stretch the pitch in the same way. Um, You know, but sorry, Brighton weren't sitting in a deep block, but uh, Crystal Palace were. Brighton came at us, so... Like, there were gaps in their defensive line when we got at them. It was a different game, a different problem to solve. And we got, when we did get to attack Brighton, which was often, um, there were, there was space for, Pe- there was no reason for him to stand on the touchline. There was space for him to run into, get a pass. It was a different game. And I would put it to Pepe that he needs to be able to do both. And I agree with you. I think you can see both in terms of his play, but also, more importantly, in the response, kind of the body language, the response, the dynamic between him and Arteta over the last few months, that they're they're on a path together. And Pepe's doing much happier about his life at Arsenal. Maybe for the first time he looks happy, not just in a moment or with a goal, but in his existence at Arsenal, his... his <clears throat> that he actually has a future. You just get a sense that he's like glad he's here for the first time and looking forward uh, in recent times. 
just the vibe I get from him. He's like, yeah, okay, this could work. Yeah, this okay. Yeah, okay. Maybe I didn't. Uh, it, maybe I didn't get my share of the seventy-two million, but now I can actually show that I'm a real player worth big money. Maybe not that not that money, but like I I can be here. I can show myself. I can show what I've got. He looks like he's enjoying his Arsenal career now, and. Part of that will be that he needs to be able to play on the left, on the right, sometimes asked to stand wide on the touchline and in other games he'll get to come in. And that's just that's just how it is. He needs to be to keep developing his game and a piece of it's on him. And we didn't hire a different coach. We hired a coach that's very likely to play in the uh, Juego de, de uh, Position um style of football that's what it is um smith row is flexible he can play as a 10 he can play on the left he can play as one of two attacking mids saka can probably play as a 10 though we don't use him there much he can certainly play as an attacking 8 10 he can play on the right he can play on the left um you know that there's there's going to be two spots three players uh, flexibility needed, rotations needed. That's just the job. And we can't say this is the best spot for Pepe. Let's build around Pepe at this point. He's not that good yet. He's not Alexis. Mm. Um, but it will be a great problem to have. But And, you know, if he keeps scoring like he has over the last couple of games, then you start building your team around him. But he hasn't and he didn't. <clears throat> He's been good. He's had a lot of goal contributions and he's ending strong. But that's the challenge for him to be so good that the question is, how do we get him as a as a basically a second forward in the box? And he needs to either A, be super consistent or B, just be really good at playing in different ways. I mean, Mares will stand on the touchline in certain games and play from there. Sterling will stand on the touchline in certain games, or he'll practically be a second forward, or they'll just all be interchangeably no center forward, and they'll they'll all move into different positions throughout the game. And it's like Pepe just needs to get better and better and better as we progress. He needs to be... Yeah. He, he's shown he's coachable, and he needs to pro- progress, and we will get better, and he'll get better. I mean, it's tough, right? Because you could make an argument that Pepe's had a better season than Saka. I mean, I know that people are going to be booing the you podcast could. for me saying that, but <laughs> you, there, you there is a point at which football is about scoring goals, and Pepe does that. And it's a low-scoring sport, and players that score are valuable. And I, I mean, here's the difference. Nicola Pepe is going to be 26. This is it. This is the absolute heart of his prime. He'll never be better than the next two seasons. The best Nicola Pepe you're going to get is the next two seasons. And next season, you have 38 games that matter. That's it. Play the same 11 for all 38 games if you can. If you want to say being out of Europe is a good thing, and it can help us. It can help us if we pick an 11, believe it's our best, and use it every game for 38 games on our way to top four. That's how you make it work. And Nicola Pepe is never going to be better than he is now. Uh, Bukayo Saka is 19. He's going to be 20. He's sensational. And he still has many levels up to go. Many levels. And so the question is, can you put Saka on the left? You know, I remember Arsene Wenger, we used to get frustrated. Like, he'd play the, you know, Nick Bentner on the wing or Ramsey at right wing or, you know, uh, Jack Wilshire at left wing. He'd say, you know, these players learn something by playing in these other positions. Maybe it is a case that left wing is Saka's position for now because we are in the teeth of the prime of Nicola Pepe. Two seasons from now, we'll be out of that. Maybe he'll be moving on. And Saka will be 22. And he steps onto the right side, onto a stronger foot, cutting inside, inverted winger, and and he goes from strength to strength, and he becomes a 15-goal, a 10-assist guy. But that's the challenge right now, is how you fit these pieces together, because there's a guy in Emil Smith-Rowe saying, well, I'm ready to start every game, and I look great on the left. Can he be the 10? If so, do we not go get one? Do we avoid a Buendia or an Odegaard or an Oar and just prioritize central midfield? The challenge of having an imbalanced squad is... It's one thing when you've got 60 games a season to spread it around. When you've got 38 games that matter, it's a little trickier. So I'll be curious, but boy, those goals are fun. And Pepe uh, is a very, very fun player right now. I also think it is easy okay, to forget. I get, yeah, I was just going to say yeah. super quick how good Saka has been this season because once he crossed that 3,000-minute threshold, 
I think he's looked a little jaded. He's been played in and out of you know various positions, and, and we haven't seen his best. So please understand that when I'm saying Pepe might be better than him right now, I still think Saka is has probably been our player of the season and is a superstar in the making. But one is 19 and one is 26. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Like, we're, we'll have Martinelli, hopefully next season, we'll have a, a firing fit, Martinelli, Smithrow, yeah. <laughs> Saka, Pepe. So, like, the, there might be a pre- preferred position for Pepe, and it's getting him a little more centrally on the right. But they're going to have to all get better and play in different positions, and that's a good thing. Uh, if you just look about how, how you get the most out of next next season, I still think you can't say that you build everything about Pepe being an inside forward. Um, he's getting better, and I think we should maybe trust the process a little bit. Sure. Um, and some games he'll have he, – he might frustrate us because he'd be a little wide, but then it depends on who his fullback is, right? If it's Chambers versus – a Tierney on the right. Uh, if it's Tierney on the right, then... You, you, in other words, Ma- you mean a new fullback like Tierney, not moving Tierney. To yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> but so yeah, can yeah. I just ask you a super quick thing then, Paul? Would you yeah. at least agree <clears throat> that in order to make this whole no Europe thing count in our favor, a big job for Arteta in preseason and over the summer is going to be to decide what he thinks our best 11 is. And really, I mean, look, I'm not saying commit to it to the point where you don't change if you get new information, but really try to commit to that for next season to maximize the continuity and the success we can have in those 38 games. I think I'll have to chew on that because it's it's a good thought, but there's a dynamic, there's a tension between is it about the best 11 or is it about really defining your system Mm. and not being quite as hung up about who plays where because uh, total football, which is the inspiration for for his kinds of football is any player can pl- not quite, but to some degree you move around to the spot on the pitch and you play there and you have the skills to play there dynamically within the game. It's less hung up on playing your best players in their best positions at every moment in the Fair game. Enough. I, I think I disagree, but we'll have a whole summer to argue it. What I will say yeah. is that if you look at how Leicester won their title, if you look at how uh, Liverpool won their title, if you look at how non Manchester city teams have done it, you really do see pretty tight clusters of 11 players that make 36, 37, 38 starts. I know, again, and by the way, I'm not trying to be dogmatic. I'm saying I think, I believe, an established first 11 is the way. Let's spend the summer sort of chewing on that and seeing how we feel about it. But Tim, you want to add on on how we solve this problem? Because the funny thing is what Paul really put in my mind there is, Gosh, you know, you look at Pepe being so exciting in this game. And Emil Smith-Rowe looking fantastic down the stretch. Saka with three quarters of an incredible season. Gabriel Martinelli, when he's been on the pitch, looking like a revelation. And like, especially with without Europe, you know, oh, by the way, 300,000 pounds a week or whatever it is going to a, you know, a 32-year-old striker. So he's going to play. It's a real challenge because all of these guys are going to want to be in there. But the difference between Pepe and those other guys is those other guys are 20 and 19. And there's a lot of mm-hmm. time for them. So how do you how do you weigh those priorities? One guy going right into the teeth of his prime, and a couple other guys who look great, but who have have time on their side a little more. Yeah. So on on this, I I, I think you're nearly there, but I, I have a slightly different thought. I don't think it's well. About I'll take settling. being nearly there. It's a lot closer than people <laughs> usually feel I am. So thank you. Man. I, I don't think it's so much about settling on an 11. I, I think what happens with these teams is you get a core of 14 or 15. I think that's what Liverpool have got. And um, But the the funny thing about Liverpool, it's their midfield that's the interchangeable bit. Yeah. Everyone knows who their full-backs are, their centre-backs are on the front three. But And then there's Wijnaldum. And then the other midfield parts change a little bit. And, and I, I think you look at the Invincibles, for example... Everyone can reel off the Invincibles 11, right? But then on the outside of that, you've got Ray Parler, Edu, Carnu, Wiltord. So really you had a first 15 and we found plenty of minutes for those guys um, in the league as well. And I think that that's what we should develop here. We've got a lot of depth um, in attacking positions. And I think what we're looking at here is, you know, perhaps like... Perhaps it's too much to have, for example, Pepe and Martinelli in the same team because there's yeah, maybe not enough ball thought. retention yep. there. Mm-hmm. So share the minutes between them. D- don't share them between um, Pepe and Willian next year. Share them between Pepe and Martinelli. <laughs> Thanks um, for maybe bringing sh- us down. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Share, you know, share the other flank like between Saka and Smith Rowe, and just have those slightly those slightly interchangeable parts for Arsenal are probably the wide forwards. Um, and depending on if if we buy a number ten, it, it's why I've talked myself round to buying more of a Buendia than an Erdgaard, just because Buendia can do a couple of different roles. Um, and I I don't get the impression that Arteta wants like an absolute superstar number ten who we hand the keys over who runs us every game. I think he wants the flexibility to oh, I'll play Smith Rowe there, and then the next week I'll play Smith Rowe on the wing, and I can throw Buendia in into a mix of like five or six players. And yeah. I think that's what we should move towards next season. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Look, if you say the group is Pepe, Saka, Smith Rowe, Martinelli, and Aubameyang, and you say that that group is going to play 38 games for me in some form or fashion with maybe Balogun having some minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a hell of a front three to rotate through. And maybe you're saying at times Smith Rowe will actually slide into the 10 roll um, and it'll be three of those other guys. But yeah, I I think you can certainly make that argument. I guess Um, your point about Liverpool too is a good one, which is you should probably find a best first 11, but recognizing that you have some fungible high-level talent up front means you can be a little more flexible there. Yeah, yeah. And also, the the only other thing I'd say is, like, with Willian, if we can get rid of him by some miracle, he doesn't need replacing. We don't need that yeah. player. Like, we don't have to go and buy something. Like, if we don't get Erdgaard, yeah, we have to go out and and get someone else who can play number 10. We don't need to replace William. We can just concentrate on getting rid of him because the depth is there. So I'd be remiss in this podcast, Tim, if I didn't at least say, did Thomas Party do okay for you shooting? <laughs> yes. Yeah, <laughs> That's much better. Good positions, like good think, outcomes. He got so close. <laughs> I'd like to think my presence behind the goal helped that. Uh, particularly the enormous luminous arrow I was uh, I was carrying, uh, <laughs> pointing don't it at hit the net. <laughs> me, hit that. Maybe if having fans back helped. Maybe he felt bad at the possibility of prospect of hurting a fan and decided instead to aim for the goal. That could have been it. Um, there was no feedback loop. That yeah, was his problem. That was his problem. People well, weren't telling him how badly he was missing in the stadium. Well, all kidding aside, Tim, I, I thought party was excellent. I thought we saw. The, the Thomas party that, you know, we want to see consistently someone who's who's really dominant and dominant carrying the ball forward, progressing the ball with the right tempo, playing it to, to people in, in the kinds of positions where we could really hurt Brighton. And I don't think you can overlook the fact that he looked that way with Granite Shaka back next to him. Odegaard certainly looked better. And as, as Clyde pointed out, instead of it being Ceballos sort of on that, that left side, it's, it's Shaka. I think we're headed towards a really difficult reckoning here. Shaka just completed what probably is his best season for Arsenal in our worst season since he's been here. But it's clear that a lot of the parts in the team work a lot better. And yet I think most of us agree that he has a ceiling that we would like to break through. So how do you assess a midfield duo that looks really good when Shaka's in it and not so good when he's gone, contrasted with the fact that most of us feel we need to move away from Shaka at this point in his career? So... I think, you know, look, no one's going to confuse me for Shakistan. Shakistan? Is that a country? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Tottenham have They're a game, in, in, Tottenham have a game yeah. in Shakistan <laughs> next season. I guarantee you that. Boom. Um, goes the dynamite. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting one, right? He, he slots in and, and all those players around him look great. Thomas Party looks elite. And yet here we are saying it's probably time to move on from how do you square those, those contrasting emotions or yeah, analysis? I, I, yeah. I think one of um one of the most interesting things about the game, and I know you guys spoke about this a little bit on the instant reaction pod as well, was it was almost like um it was almost like a catwalk for midfielders. It's almost like Xhaka and Basuma. It, it kind of had a bit of a Zoolander um, kind of vibe to it in terms of them like both catwalking and going what. Well, I'm the partner for party next season. <laughs> um, and I, been... Odegaard can only turn left. Wasn't that Literally, yeah, that was a Zoolander thing, yeah. And, uh, I got and, that yeah. reference. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it was, yeah, yeah, because, I mean, I think you're right. I think party looked great. Um, but I also think there's something about Xhaka looked great as well. And I, I think there's an argument that Xhaka has been our best player in the second half of the season. I really do. Um, mm. like, you know, I, I think like, a lot. I'm. I'm just not 
Right, I'm going to say it because there's another three months till our next game. <laughs> I'm just not seeing those flaws at the moment that used to annoy me. Like I always used to think, useful player, but God, he's got some flaws that are irritating. I'm just not seeing them Yeah. Um, at the moment, whether that's because of him or because the system is hiding them. Um, I suspect it's a bit of both, but I thought Xhaka and Party as a pair were, were brilliant. And obviously the issue is that <laughs> the backups, you know, in Elneny and Ceballos, it, it really, really falls off um, between those two. And then you've got Bissouma, you know, playing for Brighton and doing like almost like party stuff, like in terms of I was looking at him and I was thinking he is simultaneously like playing four, six, eight and ten all at the same time here. Um, and maybe you can have two guys that do that. I'm sure you can. Um, but yeah, I, th- I thought Xhaka was great. I thought Party was great. I thought this, this was just a game. I, I think in general, those two as a midfield partnership have looked very good. Um, I will never be against an upgrade. I would be very much for very good becoming excellent. I, I don't know exactly how that happens. I, I don't know what the market's like. I, I wouldn't be absolutely... Like I wouldn't be furious if we go into next season with, with Xhaka and Party, um, particularly with no Europe... Um, you know, I, I, it'd be great if we bought Basuma and we could maybe do something with that midfield three a bit like I was describing with the front line. Um, again, I don't know exactly how that works in practice, but I, I don't think midfield depth is an issue um, for Arsenal. But I don't I just don't think Xhaka and Party is that big an issue. Maybe it, it's a bit like Pepe. I had this thought about Pepe where. I'm I'm like, yeah, he can be quite wasteful and frustrating. But for me, that's a conversation when you're fourth and you're trying to get to first. So like the one that Liverpool had with Coutinho and it's like, yeah, he can win you a game. But fuck me, he puts the ball into the stand <laughs> quite a lot and it's quite irritating. <clears throat> and when they were doing their right, we're fourth, we want to go first. They considered him expendable. We might think something like that about Xhaka, about party. You know, if we get there and then you go, yeah, okay, we need the next step now. But at the moment, like, I don't think that Xhaka would be the reason that we wouldn't get in the top four, if that makes sense. It's a real challenging. Uh, Yep. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, to your point, like, I, I, Xhaka may still be our ceiling, but maybe we're reevaluating where that ceiling can be. And it might be good enough for where we want to be next year. Well, that, that's an interesting point, which, right, is, I mean, a lot of people have observed that we've never finished top four since Shaq has been here. I don't think that's all on him. I think we've seen seasons where his flaws were much more prominent. That's not the case now. And I do wonder if some of that is Thomas Party, and we should we should certainly appreciate that, that the partnership works. Midfields are often about partnerships as much as individual talent. The challenge, Clive, is... Granit Xhaka has two years left on his deal, so we don't have to do anything right now. He will be 29 next season. But with no Europe... I don't think Granite Shaka wants to stick around for, hey, we're going to go get Basuma and you'll play when one of him or party aren't available or we'll rotate you in occasionally. I think Granite Shaka is a leader. You can see the way the players respond to him. Setting aside any issues I've had with him in the past, there's no debating that he does seem to be the kind of popular figure who has a leadership presence in the dressing room. I don't know that that guy in his prime of his career, the end of the prime of his career in 29-year-old season is going to want to just graciously say, I will take a back seat to another central midfield pairing that I will be a rotational option for. So I feel you are in a position as uh, director of football, which you now are, Clive, where you have to say, we are going to try to upgrade this position. And as painful as it is to move on from Shaka, we're going to do it. Or you have to say, we still think there is enough in this player, in this partnership to get where we want to go with him and not make a move at that position. I don't see how you upgrade Shaka and keep Shaka. Is that, I mean, so so for you, the, the partnership, Shaka party, it clearly works. You clearly want to upgrade it. Can you do that and still keep Shaka around? How would you, how would you solve that problem? Well, you, you can't keep him around. He's not, that's not his personality. He's, he's not a rotation option, not in my mind. And, and so, probably not in his mind either. <laughs> yeah. Well, how long has he been here? Five years? Yeah. Five years. This is probably his best partner, who's really only revealed himself since Christmas, really consistently. And even then, he was doing seventy-minute games. And so, if you look at since Christmas, since Boxing Day, what what really happened? We we found Smith Rowe in in the number ten. We flip Saka over to the right, away from Tierney. So immediately, you switch your danger to both sides rather than one side. Parties come into the 
midfield and suddenly we've got a base in midfield which looks competitive. And Odegaard's come in and flicked in that position and with Pepe's improvement, that's basically what's happened since Boxing Day. We even had the situation where we could basically carry our centre forward and captain who's done nothing this kind of year. And we were able to, could you imagine an Arsenal team doing well without him doing well? Right, so I think with Shaka, for example, what's happened is before he was asked to do too much, he was asked to be an enabler for other people, a playmaker for everybody else, be a leader, the tackler, the guy who makes all the tackles around the box. And he snapped on occasions. Now with this midfield, he's got someone next to him, much like his Swiss partner who plays in midfield with him, that can take a huge burden off him physically, a huge burden off him playmaking. And where Shaka's really good is he understands what's left on the plate to eat and he goes and eats it. You know, he doesn't try to do everyone else's job. He's like, okay, that's what's left. I'll do that really, really well. If we need someone to eat what's on the plate, they can call me. I'll take half of what Shaka's making. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so, and, I, and that's that's a that's a skill in football, by the way, to look around you and say, okay, that job's taken care of, that job's taken care of, this job needs me. And that is a really good. And Lacazette does the same thing. You know, he looks around at all these young boys and says, I know what I need to do for them. I need to be a man for them. You know, and then and he does that really well. And I think Jacker does it really well. And I love that intelligence in players that understand what's what's left for them to do, and then they do just that, not anything more. But if you give Shaka a lot of stuff to do, he'll try and do it. And that's what's happened to him in his previous career. And I think that's why he's looked a bit frayed around the edges. So um, my personal opinion is we're sitting here talking about what I've been talking about, revolution. And during this podcast, we've kept all the forwards, apart from William. We've kept them all. Now we're keeping all the centre midfielders. Right? So, so uh, we know we've got an issue of potential right back. We need to do the stuff we need to do. Just remind yourself, look at the league table. So just look at the league table and say, we've got work to do to get to the top two. I've never felt there was, I think there's two teams that really slap us around in, in Liverpool and, uh, and Man City. I think Manchester United, on our give, any given day, we're right there. Chelsea, I, I'm, not, I'm not overly promoting them. They've got a lot of expensive young talents that have yet to settle. And they're, you know, Everton, we spoke about them, absolutely rubbish. West Ham have had their, you know, non-European season. And they make, they've maximised and stole our place in the Europa League. Spurs are the club that had the problem coming, didn't realise it was coming. Now they recognise it's here and they're in a rebuild mode and they are behind us. They are behind us in that life cycle. And Leicester, you know, because they didn't get into the Champions League, they are everyone's second favourite team, but... You know what? Have they reached their ceiling? Have they reached it? People are going to start to look at their players and have they reached it? And can they make another another season in Europa League? Look at the injury toll on them this year with that European season. It's going to be interesting to see where they go. So we're sitting there with a, a development year successfully done. Not successful on the league table chart, but on player improvement. We have a number of players that are on the up curve. And we need to be brave and say, you know what? I've seen the ceiling on you. I need to do something about it. And we need to do that. Otherwise, we're going to be bumbling around amongst another set of teams that are going to be upgrading their talent with no recourse. No, We've got to be ruthless and do what we need to do. And let's remember the things that we've seen over previous years. And it's not a, a dig on the player because I've never really dug Shaka out, to be honest, because I recognise his value. Same. But I really do feel we're a football club that needs Shameless. to go on the level. Shameless. We need to go on the level. You know, sometimes you can just take it out on people because they've made an obvious mistake and it's frustrating. But we need to go on a level. So to do that, we need to make decisions on people. We need to do it and upgrade them and don't worry about it. It changes real quick. We spent four months talking about Meza Ozil pre season up to Christmas. And since. Since he's gone, I look at my timeline, there's nothing on there. We forget people really quickly, really quickly, because other people come in and do the job. Yeah, We just need to be prepared to do that. Well, I think there's another job that we need to discuss, uh, both on the pitch and off the pitch, so we'll, we'll get to that. But first, I want to uh, take a quick break to uh, hear from uh, our sponsor today. It is called BetterHelp, uh, and no, it is not a transfer 
promotion. But so we'll, we'll do that. We'll step aside. We'll take a quick break. We'll hear from them or about them from me. And then we'll come back with more of this nonsense. Stay with us. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. The service is available for clients worldwide, and you can log into your account anytime to send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life. Here's what a few people who have already tried BetterHelp have had to say. Andrea is an absolutely amazing therapist and I would recommend her to anyone. She has helped me tremendously with my mental health and has helped me stay on top of it and also understand my symptoms and triggers. My anxiety is now under control and I have her to thank. I am so grateful. Elizabeth is great at discerning my areas that need work and wonderful about helping. She's a genuine, kind, and compassionate person. Visit betterhelp.com forward slash vision. That's betterhelp.com forward slash vision and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people are using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states in the United States. A special offer for Arsenal Vision listeners, you can get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash vision. Betterhelp.com forward slash vision. Go there now and get the help you need. Okay, we're back. Uh, real quick, uh, Clive, I, I know we just finished with you, but I just want to ask you this super quick. I mean, as we're thinking about systems and partnerships and what we have to do on the pitch, um, it was a really, really disappointing season for Aubameyang. We will get to that in our, our season summary. Uh, some of that, I think, is overstated. I think he had some periods where he was good. Obviously, malaria doesn't help. There, there's a lot of, of factors to the season he had. But in terms of this particular performance, I, I think that there is some differences of opinion. I saw things from him that worried me a little. Times where he was in beyond the defenders and was sort of slowing down and got caught from behind or we lashed at the ball kind of wildly. Not really the, the penalty box assassin we expect from him now to be fair. Um, you know, he's also still recovering, I think, his full fitness from from the malaria situation. Um, but it is it is an interesting situation we find with, with Aubameyang because there's Lacazette's future that needs to be determined. And we have some young players who could be interesting in the striker position if he were to not be available. So just in terms of this performance, was this one that you thought was pretty much okay? He, he played the role, it didn't happen for him, or do you see signs of, of maybe things to be a little concerned about with where we go at striker? Yeah, this is one that I'd like to be in the stadium to see, and I think I on my TV I kept seeing him hanging left quite a lot. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, really quite yeah. a lot, and I thought, oh, come on, man. Okay. Just by being central, stop thinking about your goals. Thinking about think about your position. Just find yourself in the half space, not outside of the fullback, but inside of him. You know, and um, just make a centre half and fullback think about what they've got to do. And when he goes into the box, what he's doing? Oh, I feel like I feel I don't feel good saying this because this guy's a genius in the box. But I think I think he hides behind people a bit too much. He just needs to gamble a little bit you know, on his movement, and things will happen for him. But you know, when he gambles on the back stick against Benfica in the last minute, I'm thinking that's that's brilliant. You know, and um, at the moment he's just not moving well with any sort of belief the ball's going to come to him. But he was okay on this day, and I, 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 the problem with him is I think he's, I think he's soft mentally. I've always felt that. I think he's soft mentally, and when he's hot, you can't look anywhere else. And when he's not. He can't look anywhere else. There's nothing in between. You know what I mean? You can just see everything on his face, everything in his movement, everything just reeks of, I'm under stress. And then suddenly he does something beautiful and it just looks so easy. Yeah. And I'm just holding on for the for the nice sunny day. right? And 
Now you have to, I look at Arsenal Football Club and the team that we have, and I always find myself in my mind building a team in my mind. I'm sure many people do the same, pick their players. And I look at us and I, and I just look for him being a reference point for us. And he's not at the moment. He's not in any way in his game, in his output, in his body language. I mean, he's, he's the captain of the team and, I listened to podcasts every day and they were talking about things about the ESL and talking about the wage deferrals and talk about things going on in the clubs. I think um, Jordan Henderson had to get all the captains together. It's never him. It's Hector, it's Hector Bellerin. It's other people. It's Shaka do those leadership roles. So he's he's not doing that. And people say, oh, it doesn't really matter how long he scores goals. But there's something amiss there. I'm not sure what it is with him. I'm just going to scratch the season off and say, mate, go and put on the three or four kg you lost. Get your legs up, rest, get yourself healthy again, and come back and just ask yourself, are you going to be part of this show? And it looks like Arteta said the last few games in his selection says, you're my centre forward and I'm going to play you there. And I quite like that. I quite like that. You've got the contract, you're playing, I'm going to play you back into form. He hasn't played Lacazette, which tells me potentially he could be going out the door, potentially. And so... I haven't got the answer for this one, mate. I think it's in the soft factor world. I really do. Mm. I think it's down to him and how he feels. I don't think there's any age issue or anything like that. I just think it's all about how he feels about playing football at the moment. I think he's struggling with the fact that he's not looking like the franchise player. I think he's not. I don't think he's dealing with it very well. But I could be just surmising there. But in the end, I look at football and look at what I see. And I always say to myself, same thing with him, just start moving. Just start mm. moving. The ball will come. When you start moving and stop believing the ball's coming, then I know you're lost to the game. So just start moving and build a game that way and and he'll come back and he'll show us his, his true class and quality. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it is difficult because there are so many factors, but you look at players that are nearing the end of their career who have been stars, who are on big money and – Maybe you're struggling to do some of the things they used to find easy and have gone through things like malaria and a down season and changing managers and changing roles and now no Europe. And it's it's not the ideal situation for a guy at the tail end. You want a hungry, chomping at the bit player who doesn't care what competition we're in. He's just happy he's at a big club and he's going to go prove to the world that he can take the next step up. It's not a clean fit, but he's the guy we've hitched our wagon to. And so to some extent, we have to make that work. Um, Paul, I, I think, you know, we'll certainly think about it. I, look, the club needs to get better at making hard choices. People like Lacazette, he's been a good servant. He has to go. Granite Shaka, probably the same thing. Probably has to go for all the reasons Clive uh, set forth. And we're, we're going to have to be more decisive and better at making some of those hard calls as we go forward. And one of the hard calls is going to have to be made at right back. We have... Really, three of them. One out on loan in Maitland-Niles, who doesn't want to be a right back. One in Hector Bellerin, who both club and players seem to be reaching the end of their time for one another. And one in Callum Chambers, who has stepped in and done a pretty nice job filling in. And yet, I think we get the sense that none of them are the level we need. I was really impressed with Chambers yesterday. I am starting to allow love in, allow myself to believe, why couldn't Callum Chambers, at least for where we are in our process right now, be the guy to be our right back? Um, we have said, gosh, I said we had three, we have four, we have Cedric. How could I forget Cedric? <laughs> after, all the, after all of my tours of duty in the Cedric Wars. But it is a position that is really uh, frustrating in some respect. Four players for one spot, none of whom were wedded to, and a position that is increasingly important in modern football. So I like Chambers' performance, given how much work there's to do on the squad. Is is he a guy you'd feel okay going into next season as as that first choice at that position and we just sort of clean it out a little bit before we refresh for the future? I like Chambers a lot. Um, I always, even like this isn't revisionism, even the day after the Jefferson Montero incident, I thought we overreacted a little bit, including, uh, and we includes Arsene Wenger because he basically kind of stopped playing him at that point in that position. And he was consigned to centre back and apparently it was at full and occasional uh, or not occasional, but a seasonal DM for them. The boy could always play football. Um, and are there examples of fullbacks who are not super fast, but are clever and technically good? Um, 
he's got a superb cross. It's, uh, you know, I, I kind of used it a bit tongue in cheek, but it's a bit uh, Trent Alexander Arnold ish at times. Like, he's just really good. I want you to know uh, you did get ridiculed for that. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. And it's like, I know it's, it's ridiculous, and he hasn't earned that, and I haven't earned the right to say it, but fuck it. Yeah, why not? Um, <laughs> it, no, no one, no one's gonna make fun of you here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, screw I might, them. but no one else. Yeah, yeah. Um, but hopefully, people, people will be warm and generous and understand what I mean. In that, of all the people who put in cross, like him and Tierney are the guys who bang in the quality crosses from wide, and Saka can do it, and Pepe can out- absolutely do it. But they tend to be maybe on, uh, maybe their inside foot when they're playing from the right. Chambers and Tierney are the guys who can go to the byline, though Chambers doesn't need to do that. Uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold doesn't go to the byline to bang in those crosses, and I think that's why it's an interesting model. Look where Robertson and Arnold put in their crosses from. They're the guys who hit a cross er early from a little deeper very often. Now, it's nice to have the additional threat, um, but, you know, he's like if he bombs forward, um, it's... There's going to be the pass for the overlapping lapping full back. He's probably going to beat his man at, at near or full speed. Um, get to the byline and bang in a quality cross. And they're almost always quality cross. Um, his crossing's excellent. It's superb. Um, he's got quite a nice technical game to help you build up. And we will often want three at the back. So Tierney bombs forward. That'll be our more attacking wing. Chambers' wing is the more conservative wing. Um, So he will often sit in a three. This happened a lot in the West Ham game where they kind of formed a three. But as soon as we had control and possession and were moving into the attacking third, Chambers would kind of, he'd be half a step behind, but he'd move up into midfield. And then as the ball progressed to our side of the pitch, He'd be the surprise attack coming up the right. I mean, that's that's a great game for him. That's a great model for us. The question is, will we have Tierney for 38 games next year? And when we don't have Tierney on that side, who do we have? Because if you had the Tierney option uh, for all 38 games, you'd certainly play that on the left. And I think Chambers is a beautiful counterbalance to that. And he gives us height defensively, uh, gives us a bit of uh, girth. Can I say that? A bit of heft, can I say? I think I can say heft, um, and and solidity. And him and Holding seem to have a nice camaraderie on and off the pitch, and understanding to hold up that side. If Holding's a frequent or maybe our go-to um, centre back, so there's a lot to recommend us. Do I would I be happy if we went into next season with Chambers plus a backup? Uh, uh, that again, that might be another one of those. How much money do we have, and how many problems can we fix in the summer? I would like a Tierney type option on the right too, so that depending on the game, depending on on Tierney's fitness, we can still rip them a new one going up the wing. And I don't think Chambers is that guy. Um, so when we have the mo- if we have the money, if we- when we have the money, maybe we get a young Tierney in. Tierney's pretty young. But uh, he, he's, he's kind of the finished item is the difference there because of how much he played and the maturity he developed up in Scotland. Um, but if we got the next Tierney on the right in and had him in Chambers cover the right-hand berth, I think that would be great if we could get somebody in for $20 million who was the future or $15 million who might be the future. Maybe that's the way to go. Yeah. I, I find myself, Paul, just sort of torn on where what issues we should prioritize addressing this summer because I don't have any sense of what our budget is. And I also yeah. think, you know, one thing that you can fall into the trap of is, oh, we're going to overhaul the squad this window. You can very rarely overhaul a squad in one window. And given that yeah. we don't have a lot of games next season, uh, continuity may be important. And so it may be the case of one really strategic addition that makes all the difference rather than five big changes. And suddenly you're, you know, in mid table come November because you've been trying to incorporate too many new players. So for some reason, two feels like the number two key acquisitions in this summer window. And then other stuff kind of, yeah. To, to 
cover holes or for the future. But well, it feels like there's if you got two, you know, I'm not saying Basuma, but if you got a Basuma and, and a, a high quality right wing or a, yeah, exactly. Basuma and Buendia, you'd have blown it away. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I mean, at some level, you do. No one's saying we should have the perfect squad by next season. So then you're left saying, well, do we have players at each position that we can at least rely on? And I, and I will admit, as I said before I turned it over to you, I am beginning to believe that Chambers at right back, while not the solution we want long term, could be a season's worth of capable player with a Cedric behind him because Cedric is still here. <laughs> He's not going anywhere. Um, but, but that does mean making hard choices. And I'm going to say this, Tim. There may be no more hotly contested topic around Arsenal right now than what to do about Joe Willick. Joe Willick Mm. is doing the thing that when other players do it, we praise them for it. So Mm. that thing, by the way, putting the ball in the back of the net, scoring goals. There is literally nothing you can do on a football pitch more important than scoring goals. And if you can consistently do that, you are one of the most important players in football. If Joe Willick... And this may be controversial, but I'm going to say it. If Joe Willick scores a goal every single game he plays, he's going to be one of the better players in the league. Um, you know, and I realize that, that that could be seen as inflammatory by some people, but I really believe it. Um, so then here's here's the problem. I see both sides to this. I see the reality that we're a team that doesn't score much. He's a player that scores a lot. How can we have the luxury of taking a 22-year-old player who's scoring a lot and saying we don't need him? The flip side is... Do you want to make a decision about a player based on over 60 first team appearances where we really couldn't find a fit for him? Or do we Mm. want to let a seven game goal scoring streak where his value will never be higher become the thing that we use to determine his future? I mean, realizing that if we decide, nope, we're not going to sell now. We're not going to cash in when his value is at an all time high. We're going to once again try to shoehorn him in with even less football to use him in next season. We might blow 10 or 15 million in value that we could have had right now. So I acknowledge he's doing a thing that makes him very interesting. I just don't see how we can move off the solution that the time is right to sell. Do you have a different view on it? No, no, I completely agree. I, I've thought about this as well because I can definitely see two sides to it. And and again, it's not something I'd be furious about if yeah. um, Joe yeah. Willick was an Arsenal player next year. I, I think the thing is the role he would play because I've been thinking about, well, like you say, he's played a lot for us and it hasn't quite happened other than in the Europa League where maybe the team's configured a little bit differently. Obviously, the opponent's uh, a little bit weaker. And But I keep thinking, let's not repeat the Eddie and Nketiah mistake where Eddie and Nketiah, you know, scored some goals in the Europa League group stage and then January comes and January is a good market for strikers in January, particularly for teams that are struggling. I really think we should have sold um, in January. And, and you're right, like what he's doing at the moment in Newcastle, not. I mean, it's definitely not sustainable, um, you know, which is not to say he's going to become rubbish and never score again, but he's not going to score in every single game. The thing is, it's when you start saying, OK, well, where does he play in the team? Um, does he play? Does he get in ahead of Smith Rowe? No. Um, you know, do Arsenal perhaps just not buy Buendia or Erdgaard and have him as the rotational option? Well, the, the the difficulty is it's not really so much about Joe Willock's quality per se. It's about how Arsenal play. It's the team Arsenal are versus the team they want to be. Does Arteta want that kind of Deli Ali, Aaron Ramsey type? I, I don't really think he does, to be honest. And that's why we've struggled to fit him in. I think um, one of the, one of the things that's that's really interesting about this as well is it's like one of the few and and this I think tells us what we've lost with uh, not having European competition. One of the few things we've done well is use the Europa League group stages almost like we used to use the League Cup under Arsene Wenger to find out more about some of these players and come to quicker judgments on them. So with with Willock, I think we're there now. I think he's twenty one. We kind of know what he is. Scoring goals for Newcastle does not necessarily mean scoring goals for Arsenal in a completely different team that just plays completely differently. Mm. I mean, personally, I would sell. However, I wouldn't sell cheap. I don't think we're that desperate for him to go. I think he's got two years on his contract, and that complicates things as well. Because if you're going to keep to him, keep him, you've kind of got to commit to him, um, and 
you know, give him another contract. And I really, really don't think we should do that. So for me, I'm very much in the sell camp, but, you know, we shouldn't, we, you know, we should be able to command a particular price. And if we don't get it, then the player can still be useful to us next season. But like you say, without Europe, maybe less useful. Um, so it, it isn't completely straightforward. But in my mind, I'm thinking the seven goals in seven games is a bit of a gift for Arsenal and that they should they should probably accept that gift. I tend to agree with you. What I will say is I've had a lot of reactions to my takes, but being screamed at hysterically in the background, that's, that's a new one. I have not had that reaction to my takes. So. It, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apologies for that. No, no, There's a fine. small child being murdered in yeah, the background, yeah. Tim, and you're Tim, doing nothing. Tim's Tim wanting to get rid of our talented young academy player literally makes small children cry. That's that's what Tim does. Clive, I, I want to put this to you in a way that doesn't make you plant your flag in the sell or keep category, because I think it is a very complicated point. But again, just for people that are saying, well, I have to get rid of this guy. Again, realize, do we want to be the club that lets a seven-game hot streak decide what we do with a player? Or do we want to be a club that lets the entire development through our academy and over 60 first-team appearances where we have struggled to ever really get the most out of him be what determines his future? And I think, Clive, the issue is simply some players... I mean, you talked about Deli Alley, and I think it's an interesting one. Some players fit a system better than others. If we kept him, and I am of the opinion that we should not, but if we kept him, and if we... I mean, and again... There aren't a lot of games, so I don't know when he would play. But if we kept him and if he played, do you think there is a chance Joe Willett could go on to be a very important player for Arsenal where we would be glad we retained him? If so, how would that happen? What what would we have to what would we have to do with him on the pitch to 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 tease that out? Um yeah, and the reason why I chose Deli Ali, because I think he's a very similar player. I think Joe Willock is actually better than Deli Alley because he can actually run the length of the pitch. I'm so Deli here Alley. for that take, by the way, because I've never rated oh. Deli Alley. <laughs> never. <laughs> uh, Deli Alley, he's a, he's a, he's a, the way they use him at Spurs was more like with Son, Alley and Kane, and he just had to move around Kane and Son could be the breakaway guy. So Alley could just pick pockets, really simply. Go and pick your pocket, stand on the smallest fullback, head it in, edge the area shots. He can do he can do what he like in the higher end of the pitch. He wasn't there to offer structure. What did Gareth Southgate do? Oh, I'll tell you what I do. I need to get you in the team. So I'll make you one of two number eights in the midfield where you got to offer structure. With with someone <laughs> with Jesse Lingard buzzing around. Didn't work for me. Or no, that's why England got kicked out of the World Cup. They didn't have the ball enough, no control. So he's a very difficult fit. So with that in mind, similar to Joe Willett, and the way Newcastle use him is they use him with um, one of the Longstaff brothers and John Joe Shelby, who's you know not not the greatest mobility wise, but you can see a pass. So Joe Willock has a role. He says, you know what, I just need to get on this ball. I can do what I like. I can just run. You know what, I've been able to run all my football life. My number one skill is my ability to run, move, transfer up the pitch, drive, and arrive. And he's found a team that absolutely fits him, that has 30% possession most games. He hasn't got to worry about every five-yard pass that goes astray because they always have five-yard pass that goes astray at Newcastle. So he's found himself there now. And also, if we, were to, if we were to like to start to pick teams in our mind again, you can see him playing one of the one of the three in midfield, but we haven't played three in midfield consistently. So there isn't a fit. But... You could equally say, well, you know what? We there are different types of number ten. If you really wanted to find a, a way in for him, we say, well, Odegaard could go back, and we can put this guy in, and he can be a different ten. We throws a different ten. Second can play ten. He's a different type of ten. We can do a situation where we have a, a standstill reference point forward, and Joe Willock running past the forward, much like Randy did with Giroud. We could have a different system. So there is a route if you want to do it. You know, and when people say things like, you know, you're not the only one saying this. People say, oh, he's not as good as Saka, he's not as good as Smith, he's not as good as Martelli. Well, he's actually very good. He's the form player in the league. He may not fit Arsenal. And people say that, hold on a minute, this guy's actually doing it. He's doing it for real. And I do it myself. I'd like to see Buendia come in. So I'd rather sell one kid for 30 mil, buy another one for 35 mil. I've never seen him play in our team because I've watched him 
play. I see he's actually been two footed. He can dribble, he can shoot, he can score. His creativity numbers are amazing. And I think we need that. I don't, I don't know how he's going to play for Arsenal. Do you see what I mean? But, but I'm prepared to take that risk rather than take the risk of someone that actually knows the club of billions since he's six years of age. It's how we think. It's how we think. And sometimes we need to flip that thinking. However, if someone was to knock the door with £30 million, pounds, and we do need to make some changes, which I firmly believe we do need to do, there's an opportunity there, isn't there? You know, And that's where the loan system has worked. And now Wolves popped there, knocked our door last year, £15 million pound bid for him which I felt was too low at the time. I think he's got himself up to around 20 mil. I don't think he's lost value. And Willock has basically trebled his value, doubled his value. And so there could be 50 million pounds worth of talent going out the door. And we can reinvest that into people. We know who, exactly who they are, what they've done and how they'd fit in with those two players. Despite their talent, there's a debate about position, tactical fit, which I think is the key one here. And sometimes you've got to let people make their career. And I think now they've got used to playing every week. They're not coming back to um, to carry a Real Madrid loan player's bag. They're not doing that again. And we need to be careful. And so we need to let them go and fly and do their career. Yeah, I, it's, it's never easy to let these players go. But I, I think we are at a time where we, we have to make these hard decisions. Look, there's never. I, th- I think the one thing we could probably all agree, you guys. Once a decision is obvious, you've probably waited too long to make it, right? Like by the point that you're like, well, we clearly can't use this guy. He doesn't belong at our club. Well, what's the value of a player that you're saying that about? You probably waited too long. Um, you know, there was a lot of pain selling Alex Awobi, and I understand why. Academy kid, a nice player. We got a king's ransom for him, and. If you head over to Everton Twitter, I think you'll see that we probably made the right move. And, you know, by the same token, I, I think Joe Willock could be one of those players where it's painful to move on from him, but we're going to get an amount of money that I kind of suspect down the line will be saying, wow, that that turned out to be a really good deal for us. So I, I absolutely understand why people are torn, and you always want to root for your academy players to make it, but we've got serious work to do to rebuild this club, and that's going to mean making hard choices. I'm not saying this is an easy choice, but I think it's a choice we invariably have to make. So just a couple of, of last things here, Paul, it's weird kind of putting this towards the back of the pod, but there is some breaking news that Adu could potentially be in a little bit of trouble at the club, that his position might not be assured. Some people mentioning that, some articles sort of referencing it. And there was an ESPN Brazil report that he had a relationship when he was, you know, uh, working in Brazil with a disgraced former FA head who was banned for life from football, but then apparently was sort of pulling the levers of power behind the scenes. All a little bit unseemly at a club that has had some fairly unseemly rumors about backroom dealing, uh, at least associated with us. So, you know, he I didn't see him sitting with Josh Kroenke and Vinay at the stadium, and I could be wrong about that. I certainly didn't see it in any of the camera stuff, and I didn't see it reported. Do you have any sense of whether there... I mean, look, what am I going to ask you? Do you think this is true? How would you know? But what's your what's your <laughs> feeling about the possibility of Edu's position not being safe just in terms of maybe being the best possible outcome? Do you, do you have a feeling about that one way or the other? Yeah. Look, if you're looking for an opinion uh, from somebody pulling something straight out of their ass. On yes, your always. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Though apparently... Uh, if we can get Tim talking about some of his medical tests, he's also the man. But that's another story. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it's going to be, this is a really interesting summer for Edu. We already thought that just in terms of this is a summer he'll be on trial. He's flying solo. There's no Raul to help or to blame or to hide behind um, or to confuse. Um, <clears throat> look, there's talk about, uh, look, Here's my speculation and the speculation. There's talk about uh, Edu could be potentially on the chopping block and that his position or Arteta's might be safe and stuff. On the other hand, how the hell would anybody know? Uh, like, I don't think the Cronkies are the kind that go around telling people that, you know, Edu might be for the chop. Um, the only people would know if, if Josh was seriously reconsidering the Edu position, I would guess, would be him and maybe Tim Lewis, 
uh, and maybe at this point Vinay, and I don't see any of them talking to anybody now. Things people can be more talkative than you think, and things can leak. But he's in a different. He's on a different continent. I get. I think that's um, speculation driven by the fact that Josh is in town. Um, <clears throat> Josh is probably going around pretty sullen, having got his ass uh, chewed by the fans for the last month or so. He's probably not very happy with things at Arsenal, and he's letting the hierarchy know he's not happy. And he doesn't, you know, don't wake me up with this shit uh, <laughs> when I'm in, when I'm sleeping. You know, he's the president. Don't wake me up with this shit. Deal with it yourself. He's I could imagine he's in town saying, you guys, look, we put a lot of money in. However, they did it last summer. We bought players. We did all the things we asked of you. Now it's your time, your turn to get your shit together, to handle shit. Uh, because I don't want to have, I don't like being in the firing line. We've got a business to run. We've got important things to do. This looks bad. Uh, get your act. So there could be a lot of just stomping around in his. He he wore his his heavy shoes, the ones with the the old style firm firm heels, and he's stomping around the place, being the big boss in town. And people are a bit nervous, and rumors are flying. I mean, who knows? But it is a big summer, like. If they rip Edu out at this point, um, I think our summer is kind of screwed. Like we're in flagrante delecto at the moment with Ooh, Edu and Arsenal and our summer. Yeah, um, and like you, you don't substitute your love maker halfway through the session. So mm. I think we, we're going to have the whole summer with him, which means. I mean, we did it to Raúl. <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's very, very different. Okay. Uh, because Raul got done in for his transactions, the previous, you know, kind of leading up to it, not the transactions of that summer. Right. Um, and like it was the year, like next summer could be Edu's summer. I, again, this is speculation. It could be anything. But I think Edu gets this summer, like even if Kroenke has serious concerns about whether he's got the right people there or not. Well, guess what? Edu gets this summer. And if it goes well, you say, well, OK. It looks, you know, it's a bit like the Chaka conversation. Oh, okay. It looks like he actually performed. Maybe we need to give him the time to see how his next window goes and the one after that. So, uh, but like either way, uh, Edu, this is his summer to perform. And if it goes well, he's probably fine. And if things continue to turn into a bit of a pooey mess, like the, the scouting things really interesting. Because it was Edu, for all the things about Raul, Edu leaned fully into, we don't need scouts, we'll use video, and we'll keep some scouts in South America and Brazil. And we haven't seen anything from those scouts in South America or Brazil coming through. And we've suddenly gone out and we're hiring uh, scouts, but not through Edu. We've, we've taken the independent route to hiring a scouting organization. That's really, really odd to me. It was odd anyway. Like that's like that you need a recruiting organization to find uh, scouts is almost a tautology. How do you not, how do Scots, scouts not know who the scouts are? Do we not know who the best people in the game are at this point? What the hell? Now, I know some of it's for on the continent, but still, are we are we that far behind in the scouting game that we need a recruitment organization or do we actually kind of know what we want to do? We just don't want to do it through our existing personnel or infrastructure maybe they don't have the bandwidth maybe it's like when you go hiring people but you bring in a recruitment organization to recruit the people you kind of know you want you just don't have the bandwidth and they're basically acting as your employees so but that bit's really interesting how do we not need scouts last summer suddenly we need scouts that that's a that seems like the biggest indictment that i can see so far that i can clearly lay at in De- Edu's feet. That's a 180 degree reversal. Um, oh, and it might look like, oh, and by the way, we're going to get these scouts, but they're not going to be the scouts that Edu picks. Yeah. Um, Clive, you want to have a quick go at this? Because, uh, Tim, I also want to ask you just a quick question about the, the Brazil uh, underhanded nonsense reporting stuff and get your take on that. <laughs> yeah, Clive? Yeah, I think 
Eddie's role is probably one of the most important roles in the club. And personally, I'm still building my trust with that. And I'm not sure if he's quite the right person for a European role where you need to have European knowledge, you need to have a real stretch across Europe. And I think with the Kia thing, for me, there's a conflict of interest there which doesn't look healthy. It's not about what you do, it's how you're operating, which I think is key, and how you're perceived to be operating to the outside world. And I think there's issues there. If you've got an agent that's close to the club trying to cover the gap that you may not have because of your lack of European knowledge, then that's a problem because your network is now driving your decision making. And I'm not convinced that Arsenal's network is broad enough, given the fact that we've ripped it apart completely and are rebuilding it. Now, there's other ways to get players. That's not the only way to get players. And Arsenal is not a, it's not a dog and duck, right? The people will reach out to us selling their wares. So it's not like it's the end of the world. But I do think as a club, it's really in a situation where it's revealed itself, particularly Super League. And we, all, we can all really have a go at the manager for not picking the right team against Villarreal first leg and not making the right substitution. That stuff is really transparent. But what really dictates what, how we move and how we operate and exactly the next steps that we actually all agree we need to do, Edu is front and centre in that. And I don't think that's a role where you can carry any inexperience or any poor ways of working. And I think he, I think he's under focus. And when I saw that today, I did not shed one half of a tear. I want us to be better, a lot better. I want people out with motivations who I don't trust in the club. I want agents out to look after their players and stop other players coming in. That's what we need to get rid of because the club will not trust anybody or anything until we make those changes. If I'm the clunky, I'm thinking, you know what, I need to do something. I need to do something. And I would look at that role and think, this is sort of making sense to me. But um, there's the other side to the coin that he's done very well keeping Balogun and keeping other contracted players he wanted to have. Arteta speaks well of him. But that's you heard my first part of that speech and that tells you where my, I am at the moment. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm up for There are people that you know, Elia, and you know Paul and Tim. They're out there that are available in Europe that can do that DOF role really, really well in a really modern way. And I'd like to see Arsenal change its, change its outward perception by making that type of hire. Well, I think also getting a person like that could massively improve, improve is the wrong word, but massively change things for Arteta. Make it easier for him, simplify the job for him. But, but Tim, I'm just curious, were you aware of any of the stuff that was reported? Um, I mean, not aware of like the scoop, but you know, that, that this yeah, was yeah. someone who had been banned for life and how he was thought of. And <clears throat> does it lead to you to have any kind of thoughts on Edu that might be different than what you had previously, knowing that he was sort of dealing with him or, or allowing him to deal with the, the team behind the scenes? I mean, how, what, what level of familiarity did you have with, with that person in that story? Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, so the, this is this is kind of difficult to <laughs> to phrase delicately. Mm. Um, in an organisation like the CBF, and in any um, quite kind of top ranking um, organisation like that in Brazil, corruption is just the way things work. Yeah. It just is. It's just the way that stuff gets done, which is not to say that the people involved with it in, in a, a, you know, a guiltless. Usually they're not. So uh, Marco Polo de Nero, um, who is the disgraced former head of the CBF, is, yeah, incredibly uh, corrupt. corrupt. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's why he's been kicked out of football. Mm. Um and so my, my if FIFA my kicks you out of bit, football for corruption, yeah, you've done a corruption. <laughs> you've yeah, done a corruption. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I'm not. I'm not surprised to hear you know this story about him pulling. Um, you know whether it's true or not, I've got no idea. But I'm not surprised by it at all. And and in Edu's position, it's I my read of it is it would be a delicate one because he'd effectively have to become a whistleblower. Um, like I, I don't yeah. get the sense that he was like an instigator of it, but it was like, this is the way things are. And that's that. And, um, and cause the interesting thing, just to give you, I guess a little bit of the context, the background, like Edu, Edu wasn't a CBF man, right? You usually, those are the guys that get those jobs. It's the kind of, you know, um, the greasing the wheels kind of thing. That wasn't the case with Edu. There was a little bit 
I think, reluctance to have him for no other reason than they usually put their own people in these uh, positions. But the, the thing was, Chite, uh, when they appointed him in 2016, he was the, and, and they're they're still in a position where they do not want a non-Brazilian coach coaching the Brazilian national team. Like that, I think we're at least a decade away from that. Even though, the, but the coaching, the pool of coaching talent in Brazil is very very small. So Chite was the only person for the job. He by miles the best Brazilian coach and he was available to them. So he had a very, very strong hand and he made Edu coming with him a condition of his employment because he had that power in the negotiations. So Edu was Chite's man. He's not really a CBF. He's not really a company man. Mm. Um, and and so he, he did kind of come into it, I guess, as a bit of an outsider, which I say to Edu's credit in terms of he's not one of those, like, I don't think he's one of those, like, you know, crooks, effectively, that are kind of all over that organisation. Um, he, he was a little bit more of an outsider. However, I, I would have some kind of sympathy. It's one of those things, I think it's just easier said than, like, if you want to say he should have been a whistleblower, he should have said, no, this is wrong, you know, that that's kind of fine. But at the same time, I do think it's kind of easier said than done. And particularly in an environment like that, where it's so endemic, um, just like so overwhelmingly endemic, I can kind of see why maybe he was like, oh, OK, whatever. But so my, my sense of this is that actually I think and I could be wrong. This is just a prediction, really. I think this story for Edu, I think this story will die down a little bit. It's just like it's a little bit of a question mark at the moment. But if Arsenal were looking for maybe another excuse to move him on, like I wouldn't be surprised if that did happen this summer. Again, I'm not saying I think it will, but I wouldn't be surprised. And if Arsenal were looking for another reason, for example, they could point to it again, George Graham said this before and I'll say it again, that bung stuff, Arsenal knew about that. They knew about that a long time before they sacked him for it, but Arsenal was 16th in the table. <laughs> it was like, um, yeah, okay, we're going to sack you for that thing now. Um, it wasn't quite that simple, but so it, it, it could count against him, not, I think, because his name is about to be absolutely dragged through the dirt and disgraced because you could like working for the CBF that is swimming with sharks. And, you know, um, you know, what's that saying about like, if you lie down with dogs, you'll get fleas like mm. that. That just is the case with the CBF. Um, so I, I don't, I don't, I don't honestly, my read is that that's probably not going to be an enormous story, but uh, Arsenal could say like, look, we've got a couple of doubts and, you know, Here's, here's another, you know, it could be a straw that broke the camel's back type scenario. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it seems like a story that's just starting to unfold. So it may prove to be nothing or it may prove to be something. I think it is fair to say, though, that whatever your take on Adu, no one is wedded to him enough in this role that we'd be sad to see him go. And I think some of us have enough skepticism about him in this role that if we could bring in someone really good there that could move the needle for the club in an important way so one to keep an eye on we have a lot of end of season wrap up to do and since we're at 90 minutes here i think we'll leave it there again we are going to have an instant reaction summary for the season for patrons we're going to have a season exit interview for everybody tail ended this week uh thursday friday and then Monday of next week, the individual performance breakdown, sort of rating the players and, and where we see them going. Late next week, we'll have transfer plans, a little transfer speculation, and then lots of Euros content as well. So a lot of stuff to go. But the most important thing that I want to say before we say goodbye here is just that it has been a trying year uh, and a trying season. Lots of highs, lots, that might be overstating it. Some highs, plenty of lows. Uh, but absolutely the highlight for me is just getting to talk to the three of you guys um, every day of the week about Arsenal, getting to interact with everybody who listens, uh, getting to do the live streams and, and you know chat with people in real time and interact with patrons on Patreon, the Discord, and, and everybody's feedback on Twitter. And probably say it every single episode that we love you, but I, I want to just reiterate that being able to go through the season together is what makes this enjoyable for me, certainly. And I, I can't thank you enough. And in a season where we haven't been able to congregate and gather in person 
to be able to do it digitally in this way is really, really meaningful. So I hope you'll stick with us here, in the here. summer. Yeah, and and into the next season where hopefully things will only uh, improve. You know what they say when you reach the bottom? Only one direction you can go. Or in Tim's case, uh, that's where the medicine goes. But that's a different issue and uh, one that we can discuss in another podcast. In any event, Paul, thank you so much. Uh, Paul's on Twitter. Pause my pants. Woohoo! Uh, Tim's on Twitter. Stoberto. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure as always. Clive's on Twitter. Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. My name's Alex Smith. You can block me on Twitter at Yankee Gunner. We love you. And we will talk to you after Arsenal 10. Transfer window nil. No.